welcome. This is Susan Fontaine Godwin, and I'm with Addie Quaite and Tom Aubaugh, our special guest today on It's About Writing, and we're so glad you could join us. And we're looking forward to spending time with Tom and learning a lot more about his writing and his journey and exactly how he processes and writes, and we're going to learn a lot today, so we're looking forward to it. It's About Writing is a weekly vlog by writers for writers to educate, encourage, and promote writers. Join us today as we interview Tom <coughs> with experience in all areas of <coughs> And we are very excited to have you with us, Tom. Um, Thank you, Susan. It's great. It's great to be here. It's good. I'm always glad to talk about writing and with writers. Yes, yes. And, and every time we have an opportunity to visit with a writer, we learn so much. And I think we're also really inspired and encouraged and gain a lot of new ideas on how we can improve our craft and how we can um, get back to writing if we've, if we've kind of been having a block or we're not sure where to go next. So it's really great to have you with us today and to um, have you encourage us and, and share your story with us. And I would like to mention that um, Tom has quite a, quite a bit of variety of writing that he has done. And I'd love to hear from you a little bit more about your journey, when you started writing, how you got into writing, and um, what you've learned along the way. Oh, um, yeah, that's, that's very interesting. I suppose everyone's journey is different. I will be honest, my dad was a journalist, like you are, Susan. Um, he uh, wrote for a paper in Grand Rapids, and I'd hear him typing in the basement at night. and. Um, I decided to do the same, and um, I, I wrote stories when I was in the fourth and fifth grade, but they were, they were all fine as far as they went. They were, you know, juvenile. But uh, I started really writing and taking it seriously about 1987 or so, and I started um, writing fiction then and a few poems. And um, I published my first story in a really small journal in the early 90s, and that was was more encouragement than anything else to just keep going with it, you know. Um, I went through a lot of rejections and writing two or three novels that weren't really any good, but I learned a lot from them. And I guess because I've also been a teacher um, and I could um, support my family, I continued to pursue my writing sort of in the evening if, as I could and to just continue to see it as a craft I was learning. Um, so, um, and I, I started to publish more stories um, after about 1997 and um, um, published a novel finally in 2017 and um, uh, after writing it six times. And I, I sort of saw that as an apprenticeship where I, I didn't want to self-publish. I reached a point where I thought maybe I should just self-publish this, but each time I get a rejection, I go back and I think about how I could revise it and make it a little stronger. And eventually it did get published with a small publisher and I was grateful for that. And, um, yeah. Um, shortly after that happened, if uh, just to finish my journey here, um, my son took his life and uh, that devastated my family and, and me. And I, I, uh, I was planning to start a second novel. I had all sorts of ideas for a second novel. Uh, the first novel was called Apocalypse TV. It was about a, an English major who goes on a TV show. My second novel was going to be called Radio Eden. It was going to be about a, uh, a pastor and some things dealing with that. But, uh, but with the loss of my son, I, I really, my life took it on a completely new trajectory. And I, um, I found myself, um, I had always written poetry, but I'd never considered myself a poet. But I found that poetry was the way to deal with my grief. So I began doing that. And um, this past January, I published uh, my, my short chapbook collection of poems. And several of the poems are, are my, my attempts to process my grief about losing our son and, and what, what that all has meant and 
struggles with that and struggles in terms of faith and in terms of um, fitting into our church still and things like that. So mm. and just well, going on and yeah. Thank you so much for sharing that because, um, you know, when we have a, a loss, um, especially I think kind of a, an abrupt loss or um, unexpected, uh, you know, it, it really shakes us to the core. Um, yes, yeah. And, and you know, I, I know I personally have been able to process a good bit of grief through writing as well. I lost my husband four and a half years ago. And, and, um, and so I, I think of many of our uh, listeners today um, and, and people who write have probably had some type of, of, you know, real traumatic loss or deep loss and sorrow. And so I think it's real wonderful for you to, you know, share with us today what that process is like, what that has been, what it's meant for you. And I, I imagine that many of those listening and watching today can identify with that. So, um, if, you know, if you could just share a little bit more about that um, process and, and what yeah. how that's worked for you, that would be, I think, a tremendous benefit. Oh, yeah. I, um, that's something I, I talk with people about quite frequently now. Um, it's uh, not something I suppose that everyone can do, but I think it's something that writers especially have available to us, people who process through language, people who process through words and reading, you know. Um, and uh, for me, it started as a journal, and I, I just kept my journal uh, near me at all times, and I, I just was pouring into it um, every day, what I would now call junk, you know, <laughs> just sort of just uh, whatever I was processing, whatever I was trying to remember. Mm -hmm. um, the, the loss of my son, uh, he was 17, and mm -hmm. um, I, I um, found that I, I wanted to retain everything I could about, about his life and I, for a while there. I, I no longer have that strong drive, but at the time I did, and so I started writing every day about what I could remember. You know, it was real grief stricken. It was real, um, I, um, I think the third or fourth day afterward, um, I, a poem came to me and I wrote it down pretty much. And um, it, it's, it's one of the poems in my collection now that um, it's been read at a lot of grief groups and a lot of people have uh, thanked me for it. I, I don't think I deserve thanks, but it, I just felt like it just came from the the voice of my own kind of weeping in my own um uh, my own remorse and um mm -hmm. and uh at any rate uh, a friend of mine who lost her husband recently brought it to her grief group and they appre she appreciated it and i've read it at our the, i attend a suicide survivors group and people have appreciated it there you know and i um i find that writing is um you know there are two sides to it susan there's there is you know, that sense that you're connecting with other people and they're recognizing, we're recognizing in common that we're going through this very painful experience, you know, and, and we're making some sort of sense out of it, you know. Um, the other side of it is, is the just making sense of it for ourselves. And so I see my writing as being kind of two faceted there. Mm. Part of it is me talking to myself. <laughs> You know, and occasionally that spills over into talking to others. But it, it, I've only ever kept it as I'm just going to talk with myself about this. You know, mm -hmm. there were issues with faith and with, um, you know, belief and doubt. And, you know, um, how does a loving God allow this to happen when we prayed for our son and things like that, you know. Right. There's no answer. Job got no answer. You know, um, I've sort of come around after three years to, to, um, to sort of a... a I don't know if acceptance is a word, but I've come around to the idea that I'm just going to have to settle for no answer right now. Yes, well, and, and I think, uh, you know, in, in working with songwriters, which I've done over the last 35 years, um, and done some songwriting myself, I think that, you know, that quite often, uh, some, I think that's what, a big part of the process of songwriting. It, it, it's for ourselves, but also, 
it gives word, it articulates, gives expression to something that many people find very hard to put to words. And so it's, it's like you're a vessel in a lot of ways to help articulate something that is so deeply emotional or raw that most people have a lot of trouble putting words to it. And, and, and you know, so it's a real gift um, for those who, who are, are uh, comforted and blessed by those words and also for yourself. So I, that, makes, that makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. It really does. And um, um, so I think you, you have a poem I think you're going to read for us today. Is that right? Yeah, I'd, I'd love to, that was if, you, if you want. Yeah, yeah. Um, do you do you want me to, to set it up a little at all or, or not? Yeah, I think that would be super, you know, whatever okay. you feel comfortable. And then, you know, just okay. I think poetry, uh, and maybe you can talk a little bit more about this because I've dabbled in poetry, but yeah. I think that it kind of is a really unique type or style of writing that, mm -hmm. um, that really speaks heart to heart. Yes. Um, so I'd yes. love to hear you, you know, but it would be wonderful if you could, uh, yeah, you could go ahead and, and set it up and read that for us, Tom. Okay. I'd love that. All right, Susan, thank you. Yeah. Um, I, I do think that uh, good, good poetry tries to get it, uh, what our experiences are about and what they mean. Um, this is a poem that um, I actually, it's the, end, it's the last poem in my, uh, my, my chapbook. It's called The Seeds of St. Paul. Um, my wife was, uh, I guess this was about a year and a half after maybe a, a year or, or so after we lost our son. And my wife is a music teacher. She, uh, she was uh, tuning some string. string uh, she was working with a, a um, violin and cellist players, fifth graders. She likes working with fourth and fifth graders. That's her favorite. Um, and, um, and she was tuning a cello that um, our son Michael had, had helped her to fix shortly before he died. In fact, one of the things that my wife was lamenting over and over again was pointing to this cello in our living room and saying, he helped me with that, you know, and, you know, and talking about it. So at any rate, she's in her, um, she's in this classroom, um, with the door open and she's she's tuning this cello when a when a bird trots in <laughs> to her classroom and um, the experience was so unusual that even a colleague who was with her started noting how unusual and strange it was. And, um, so um, I, I will tell you that um, one of the one of the um, struggles that my wife and I have had uh, um, since we lost our son is um, the kind of what I I don't want to put people down, but sort of the way that especially people in the church have tried to comfort us um, by saying things like, oh, he's with Jesus now, or, oh, he's an angel. God wanted an angel and took him. Those are the worst things you can say to people who are grieving the loss of their children. Mm -hmm. Terrible. Um, and, and if you also want to, you know, the best way to encourage people is to let them talk and to, to grieve. And, to express what they're feeling. But instead, a lot of people would try to tell us he was in heaven. And for me, just because I tend to, I, I process with the heart and the head. But for me, questions of heaven lead to thoughts that are struggles. Like, where is heaven? How does that work? You know, if you read the Old Testament, there's no heaven, there's soul sleep. But if you read the New Testament, you can't tell what is what's going on. There are different theological positions on all this, but we want the grieving to just accept a simple childish thing there, you know. And so, for me, that was. I mean, for me as a as a Christian, as an adult who's a Christian, I struggled with this, and I, I start. I came around to the idea that our son was was with God in some way, but but it wasn't easy. It was a weird calculus. I, I don't know if this makes sense, if it's only me and my own processing of things, or if more people feel that way. But um, it's not that I'm skeptical of the afterlife. It's just, it's hard to figure out, especially when you had someone immediately in your life and then they're gone forever. It's hard, just hard to calculate that. So mm -hmm. at any rate, this is a poem that I'm not sure it's entirely successful, but it's it's dealing with 
all of those issues underneath the um, underneath the experience that my wife had. And so it's called the seeds of St. Paul. And of course that's a reference to the passage in 1 Corinthians 15 where Paul makes reference to the idea that our immortal bodies could be like seeds that are planted. And mm -hmm. So the seeds of St. Paul, they must have been metaphors. He seized on in one moment to explain something in eternity, something of the better place, though the meaning seems harder today. To build a life more seemed drawn to butterflies. Today, a small robin, wings tucked in, trotted up the ramp where my wife was teaching strings. This was her a year after they gave her the cockatiel, and on entering where she was tuning the violins, the robin was chirping and trotted up to her ankles as though it knew her, as though it were the UPS guy with her number, and she stopped to lean down and get the thing to leap to her finger the way her cockatiel does at home, the bird they gave her after missing her son for a few months. This only got the bird outside to safety until at the cello, the instrument her son once helped her fix, the chirping came again and her colleague said, somebody must, want, must be wanting to talk to you. The third time she began to think she'd seen this one bird before and she was still with the cello and so the bird led her out to the tree behind where the portable, where the flock had tweeted, as if to say, in the one language they knew, see, we are not alone. Yeah. And that poem um, was really uh, trying to get at the idea that, you know, I try to imagine my son in an afterlife and it just, or that he's not alone, I guess, and I don't know. The, some of some of what we what I was that the poem might not be great, but it helped me to process, and I hope that other people are um, are, are encouraged by it. Yeah, absolutely, and I think that's just such a beautiful part of writing, you know, that that we are able to be vulnerable and real and honest in our writing in such a way that it touches others' hearts. And I think it connects our humanity, if you will. I, to me, that's one of the beauties of writing, is the connection and relationship with people we will never meet, but that, you know, we connect in our humanity, in our struggles, in our joys, in our questions, uh, in our doubts. And, and so um, thank you so much for sharing that. That's beautiful. Well, absolutely. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Uh, Debbie has is, is sort of been in and out with us today. Can you hear us, Debbie? I can. Um, I apologize. We are, we are our times mixed up. This afternoon, my husband and I did. We're on a, on a trip we had planned. So she's on the road. She's, she's our traveling correspondent, if you will, today. Yes. Yeah, so she's, right. been, she's not been able to be with us the whole time, but um, and and uh, we understand in our in our new world that we live in, in our ways of connecting humanity one to another, uh, we, we find we're very innovative and we find ways to connect through Zoom and FaceTime and and, and so on. Um, at any rate, well, I am, able, I am able to hear you, so I've been listening, and Tom, your writing is beautiful, and thank you. really appreciate the vulnerability you're showing and sharing, and I can't imagine losing a child. It's just yeah. awful, and I'm sorry that well-meaning people can be so hurting, and, you know, hurtful, I should say. Mm -hmm. I'm well aware of that, too. Mm -hmm. So... Thank you. Um, what are some of the things, Tom, that inspire you in your writing? Um, yeah, that's a that's a good question. Um, I'd have to say um, I write a lot from, um, and I'm 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 embarrassed to admit this a little, but I I do write a lot more than I'm aware of from my own experiences. I think there there's a lot of inspiration that comes from just looking at, at things that I go through. Um, 
I like to think that I'm also inspired by what I read. Um, but um, I think a lot of it has to do with what I've uh, gone through and, and, then, and then tried to, I, I think that I find myself using writing to process that. You know, it's not that I'm just writing true facts, but that I'm writing about what it means, either spiritually or what it means um, in just in terms of, uh, of understanding life a little better. I guess. Yeah. Well, and I think that's what makes it so real and authentic, too, um, you know, is, is drawing from experience and, and, um, and that that, you know, that comes across, that certainly comes comes through in your writing. Um, well, listen, we, I think we are kind of closing in on about 15 or 20 minutes. We, we are attempting to keep our interviews pretty short and brief so that people won't be intimidated, if you will, by looking at something and going, oh my gosh, it's 45 minutes. I don't have time right now. So we, we, right. That's fine. Kind of but we would love to have you come back too, Tom, because I oh. think this is just touching, you know, probably just um, a thimble full of what you have to share with us. Oh, well, thank you, Susan. I'd love to, I'd love to come back. And it's good talking with you about, about this subject. Yeah. yeah, really appreciate it. And as I say, I think a lot of our, our audience will be able to connect and relate to what you've been sharing. Um, because as humans, we all, um, you know, suffer grief. And sorrow and oh, yeah. In, in mm -hmm. some way. And also just that it would, you know, give us insight into um, how we can really care for and love on people who have had a loss. Yeah. Um, and yeah. Um, yeah. So, well, listen, I want to, uh, once again, I want to kind of, if you will, I'm going to put up that second slide that we had with information of the different things that you've written and where can people find you online, Tom? Um, my website is uh, thomasalbaugh.com, uh, just my first and last name, squishedtogether.com. Um, I am also on Twitter, at Talbaugh, my first initial and last name together, at Talbaugh1. Um, there was another Talbaugh, so I had to go as one on Twitter. So, um, I'm there too, and I'm, I'm on Facebook, um, and... Uh, as well, so yeah, and my my books are both on Amazon uh, um, as well. Wonderful, so. wonderful, and um, well, listen, we will definitely look forward to um, having round two or part two, if you will, mm -hmm. at some point in time. We I think it would be great to uh, follow up and have another interview with you, um, and you know, either Debbie or Terry or I will. We'll get in touch with you about that and see what we might be able to schedule. Uh, but thanks so much for your time. Thank you for sharing your heart and your experience and wisdom with us. Uh, it's really been it's really been Thank a you. blessing. And Thank you. Uh, yeah, Thank you. it's been great. And once again, it's we are it's about writing. Terry Thompson, Addie Quaid, and Susan Fontaine Godwin, and today's guest, Tom Albaugh. Thank you so much. Until next time. Be all about writing.